exactly how the Mongol Empire fell. Welcome back to another episode guys. We are taking off straight where we left in episode 2 of how the Mongol Empire fell. Only the very last of Chagatai's offspring would be eliminated. In 1705, a different Mongol state, the non chinggisid Zungars, took control, also called the Yargant Khanate. That's all. We move to the east, to China's Mongol era, when Kublai Khan passed away in 1294. He had outlived his intended heir, giving it to his inebriated grandson, Timur Ilyetsu, instead. Between Kublai's passing and Tongon Timur, Khan's ascension in 1333, a period of almost 40 years. Only Timur Lietu ruled for more than 10 years out of the nine Khans who were crowned. Widespread alchemism. Few Khans lived past the age of 35 because of assassinations. Timur Lietu made an effort to maintain the rules, but after a year, treasury was almost completely depleted due to extravagant spending. Gifts for his princes following his coronation. Additionally, he discovered the severe corruption of court in Huan. Four court and capital officials, a quota of 2,600 people was established. In the initial, it was, was discovered to be greater than 10,000 in a year of Timur Lietu's rule. Following a 1,303 investigation, some of the charges against 18,000 clerks and officials include bribery. As usual, Timur Lietu was deficient. The majority of these accused kept their jobs because they were so determined to pursue charges. Although, it has frequently been claimed that nepotism and corruption were to blame for the Huan dynasty economic woes. Lavish gift giving was prevalent and abundant. The recent research has revealed a greater struggle. The Little Ice Age. A major change in the climate began in the 14th century. In the direction of generally colder and wetter weather, this had a significant impact on the Asian monsoon season which in the 14th century took the form of a widespread pattern of severe cold weather and snowfall and droughts in the Eurasian steppe, in North China and in Southern China, where it never stops raining and typhoons. These became apparent during Timur Lietzu's first few years in power. Typhoons hit the Yangtze River Delta in 1295, causing the Yellow River to overflow its banks. Several locations experienced flooding, which led to a dry spell similar to the years before, and locust plagues that destroyed crops and persisted for the remainder of the decade. Mongolia as the longer, harsher winters starved the herds, driving thousands of people south to ask the Khan for assistance. The Huan's economic woes are directly related to these ecological issues. Kubilai carried on the Song policy of Wang Zheng, in which the government offered emergency assistance in the form of money, grain, rice, livestock and other supplies all complemented Kubilai's reconstructions efforts as well, easing the burdens placed on the lower class. No Kubilai heir dared to overthrow such law because it provided to Juan with legitimacy, but in a century marked by unprecedented climate catastrophes, this was an impossible task over such a vast area. The tour of Chinese, the Junashi and the records show a dynasty that experienced daily crisis in the years 1272 to 1357, there was nearly every other year. There is a severe famine in China, there were over 56 earthquakes reported. Superstorms in the steppe coincided with super typhoons on the southern coast. Exceptionally, certain crops could no longer be grown in the north because of the harsh winters and unforeseen frosts. They one of the most important agricultural and economic regions in the world is found in the densely populated Yangtze River Delta. Areas of the empire experienced yearly typhoons, epidemics, epidemic flooding and droughts, which destroyed towns and farmland, resulting in famines that claimed thousands more lives. A powerful typhoon struck the Yangtze Delta in 1301 alone, following a spring drought. A 40 meter high wave pushed 280 kilometers inland and destroyed 50 kilometers of arable farmland along the coast. 17,000 people lost their lives in the storm, and following this, 100,000 people went hungry. Flooding in Manchuria only a month later forced people to flee too. In August, a freak snowstorm killed herds of Mongolia, Dadu, the imperial capital was flooded, and Hebei province experienced a locust plague. 
need for survivors government assistance due to lack of grains and rice the Juan could only pay its bills in cash more money had to be printed in order to supply more money exceeding government revenue as a result of inflation Juan paper money lost value over the course of the 1300s with seemingly endless waves of natural disaster and a currency that is becoming more and more worthless the mandate of heaven or the authority to rule China appeared to be leaving the Juan. After the Moor Ilyatu died in 1307, without leaving behind any children, rivalries arose around his nephews. His nephew, Quajian, was a steppe man who had no interest in an appreciation for Chinese culture. Through his knowledge at Mongol military elite, lavish gifts, and princely court, he hoped to rule like a nomad. His friends and allies received titles and palaces. After four months of power, Question. he discovered that he had spent more than a year's worth of tax money. He frantically spent the remainder of his. Tamur Lichu made an effort to address this by raising taxes and re debts that it had forgiven. A new currency was issued, with an old currency to new currency exchange ratio of 1 to 5. In 1310, saw a seven-fold increase in the amount of currency printed compared to the previous three years. Thus, only to increase inflation, his brother, Ayo Burwada succeeded him after his death in 1311. The new Khan violently removed his brother's government officials, changed his policies and did away with his currency. A more conventionally Chinese Confucian government was what Ayo Burwada desired and brought back the system of selecting officials through civil service exams. He advocated for started the Huan legal systems codification as well as the translation of Chinese classics into Mongolian. Such was the constant back and forth between the high echelons of government and each new Khan. Each succession typically resulted in a brutal overhaul and a complete reversal of policies. Ayur Bruwada was only 35 years old when he passed away in 1320, spent the majority of his after taking on a strong mother of Uyobuwada early in his reign. He was killed in 1323. Yasun Temur, his cousin and successor, was probably complicit in the scheme. He reigned for just five years before passing away from illness at the young age of 35 in 1328. Ragibak, Yasun's eight-year-old son, who crowned at Chengdu with the help of the Chancellor of Yasun Temur, but the plan failed when the central capital at Dadu was taken over by the rebels. Prince Duke Tamur was seated on the throne by Al Tamur, leader of the formidable Kipchang Guard. Changdu was finally taken over by Al Tamur and young Ragibach Khan vanished amid the confusion. The elder brother of Duke Tamur, Koshila, soon made his way back from his exile in the Chagatai Canon. When they reconnected in August 1329, Duke Tamur acknowledged his brother's dominance. Koshila passed away four days later and Duke Tamur reclaimed the throne. However, Tuk Timur did not gain power as a result of his efforts because El Timur of the Kipchang. The Khan was only a symbolic leader because he shared real power with his ally Bayan of the Merkit. The Khan spent his reign honing his calligraphy skills, studying Chinese classics and feeling terrible guilt for killing his brother. He passed away in 1332 in place of his own minor son. He had designated Irin Jibal, the son of his brother, as his heir. El Timur who was ailing and aging, reluctantly consented, and the six-year-old Irinjab was duly installed as a mighty Khan, then passed away two months later. El Tamur was under court orders to recall Irinjibals. His older half-brother Togon Tamur was exiled, but not before El Tamur wed his daughter to him. After Kublai, Togon Tamur held the throne from 1333 until his death in 1370, making him the Huan monarch with the longest reign. Like his forerunners, he was initially a puppet. Al ally Timur's Bakan succeeded him after his passing. He wanted the imaginary world to be restored. Mongols and Chinese people were separated by Kublai in order to, which had become hazy over the years. Many government institutions forbade the presence of Chinese. The civil service exams were scrapped, the general populace was disarmed, and their horses were taken away. It was also forbidden for people to learn Mongolian and other West Asian languages. However, Wakhan also aimed to reduce court costs in order to increase government efficiency and lowering the high salt monopoly fees to ease the strain on the populace of the empire.
promoting agriculture and enhancing and accelerating the government's aid program. Of course, the fearful young Togon Tamur gives approval to all of these endeavors. Bakhan's concentration of power and readiness to react to threats with great force. This aggression sparked opposition to him, including from his own nephew Tokto. In spring of 1340, Bakhan was banished by Tokto and Togon Tamur. He passed away a month later. The very less of those who went with him, those who recognized and even celebrated the new ways, succeeded those who wanted to return to the old ways. The Mongol dynasty's sinicization, the new era of court leadership, was Tokto's representation. Tokto had a good education and promoted the fame by his uncle. Tokto, unlike Bakhan, had no misconceptions regarding restoring items from the reign of Kublai. Confucianism and Chinese culture were valued by Tokto. He believed that a strong leader and an effective government could resolve all dynastic issues. Through a number of reforms, Tokto aimed to strengthen and centralize the Huan. The less of Bayan's allies were expelled during his first term as chancellor and the greater than ever integration of Confucian scholars and government. In addition to Taktan Tamur Khan's actual visibility, the Khan finally issued a proclamation condemning. After that, he turned against his uncle Tuk Tamur for the murder of Koshila and had Tuk Son Tamur put to death. Tokto was given the responsibility of raising and educating Taktan Tamur's own son, Ayushi Ridara, and Tokto exerted a lot of effort to transform the young man into an idolized, Confucianized Mongol emperor. The environmental crisis only grew worse during this period of political turmoil. Then, in 1323, 39% of the Mongolians and other northwestern peoples had fled. In the end, no one was allowed to leave Mongolia without risking their lives, because the majority of the money printed was used to try to send refugees back with aid. It was intense. Club croplands were completely destroyed by flooding every year in the 1320s and inflation only increased more and more, and the populace became increasingly agitated. Tuktamur ruled for three years. Twenty-one uprisings started. To cover these expenses, no additional sources of income could be found, while the price of aid, the war, the legal system and corruption increased along with inflation. Chancellor Takto fantasized about creating magnificent works to astound his contemporaries, but instead his plans were thwarted by the surroundings. There were yearly earthquakes during this decade, large-scale flooding and famine, droughts, epidemics, and the beginning of the bubionic plague, according to some academics. For the general populace, anger finally started to blossom into violence. Uprising in the 1340s in central China, there were over 300 bandit uprisings in 1341. The Red Turban Movement, among others. These were a number of sporadic organizations that promoted a radical form of Confucianism and demanded the wearing of red headbands. For a violent military revolution to restore a more traditional pure China. When Tokto left his post in 1344, his successor was left to shoulder the responsibility. When the court called him back in 1349, he triumphantly returned at the time Takan Tamur Khan. Tokto had grown weary of being in charge. The dominant figure in the Huan realm at this time was Tokto. Tokto ordered the printing of large sums of money to implement his most ambitious plan, the Yellow River, south of Sangdon Peninsula, to re-enter the sea. Prior to 1344, the river overflowed its banks and flooded numerous districts and cities as a result of 20 days of non-stop rain. Draining into the Huai River after cutting off the Grand Canal, causing it to rise and the salt fields in the provinces of Shandong and Hebei are in danger. All before choosing a direction toward the Shandong Peninsula north. In particular, the danger to the salt fields was a concern. The salt trade and the taxes produced six tenths of Huan revenue, while to supply grain and rice to Daru, the nation's capital, it was necessary to keep the Grand Canal open. The plan to reroute the Yellow River was met with fierce opposition but they were able to prevail as a group, making a new coin worth 2 million ingots. 150,000 workers and 20,000 soldiers dug a 140km trench from May to December in 1351. Successfully reroute the river through a lengthy canal, the Grand Canal was fed once more. 
South of Shadong, the Yellow River entered the sea and the salt fields were protected. The goal of Tactus project was to safeguard the Huan Dynasty producers and the economy, but it unintentionally set off its eventual collapse. The large group of employees, having endured years of hunger, being punished by cruel overseers who were pressed for times, the red turbans found it to be fertile ground and was paid in money that was barely above what worthless. A mass uprising broke out in the White River Valley while construction on the canal was still going on. When the Huan were caught off guard, several cities fell quickly with few survivors. In the wake of the initial conquest, the city walls had been rebuilt in initial confrontation. The government, the forces, which included an army led by Takto's brother, were ill-prepared and routed. These were typically local Chinese rather than the highly mobile horse archers of the conquest. The militias were commanded by Mongols and Central Asians. However, Chancellor Takto was created for this. Emergency. He immediately raised new armies, enlisted militias and organized the defense. New command and training systems were put in place. He was aware that he needed to move carefully. Less poorly led and poorly compensated soldiers joined the uprising in an exhausting display of juggling. Together, they frequently moved around the commanders of large military units. The empire to stop them from developing rival power bases. The Red Army, under the command of Mongol and Turkey commanders, wear yellow uniforms. The volunteers, mostly Chinese, became talked to his armies. These were a nationwide apparatus of pacification, as historian John Dardis put it. By taking on significant campaigns by himself, Takto started to quell the uprising before pushing it back and ultimately defeating it. By the end of 1352, Takto had regained control over the Wai River Valley. They took back cities methodically and by the end of 1354, Takto was about to defeat the last. Formerly a leading figure in the disparate movement, Zhang Chicheng now lives alone in Guayu, his home province. Takan Tamuru Khan snatched defeat from the jaws of victory at the last second. At the beginning of 1355, the Khan fired Tokto for an unspecified reason, a narrow-minded, a feeble and ineffective ruler, possibly terrified of Tokto's rising power, but powerless to stop it. The military apparatus that Tokto had carefully balanced fell apart thanks to Takan Tamur. The Red Turban Rebellion erupted with renewed vigor after a large portion of the army deserted. Takto, a devoted employee to the very end, accepted his termination and was murdered the following year. The warlords of the Red Turban fought for the right to succeed the Huan as Takan Tumur sat almost motionless. After the Battle of Lake Poyang, Zhu Yuangzang quickly proclaimed the Ming Dynasty. Little control was left in Takan Tumur's hands over the other commanders, who engaged in rivalry comparable to that of the Red Turbans. Zhu Yuangzang, by the end of the summer of 1368, now seated as the Hongwu Emperor, he dispatched his dispensable general Xu Da to capture Dadu Togon. Just days before the Ming army arrives, Tamur and his heir Ayushiri Dara fled to Mongolia. For the first time in more than 400 years, Dari came under Chinese rule in September 20 of 1368. The city was renamed Beiping by the Hongwu Emperor, which means pacified north. Over time, the city changed its name to Beijing, but it still bears today, when it was made the capital of the Ming Dynasty. With the exception of a few Huan supporters who resisted for an additional 25 years, Mongol rule in 1368 saw the end of China. Contrary to what people might think, the Huan Dynasty responded strongly, responded to a severe weather emergency, but failed to resolve the scale of the problem. But only a few states, was capable of surviving such a threat while also experiencing widespread political and economic unrest that was continuously exacerbated by the environmental crisis. The fact that Kublai Khan's successors managed to live for even 70 years is still impressive in this regard. The descendants of Takan Tamur Khan persisted in asserting they were the rightful rulers of China and that the Huan dynasty was, in fact, all over historians this state is known as the Northern Huan. It continues unadaptedly. However, even the Huan Khans in Mongolia had diminished by the beginning of the 15th century by the rise of the Oirats, whose leaders were not Chinggis Khan ancestors to puppets. 
And that was it for part three of the fall of the Mongol Empire. Make sure to like and subscribe to the channel because you do not want to miss part four and the last parts of this mini documentary on how exactly the Mongol Empire fell. So click the video on screen now to watch the last part.